We're seeing in the Secret Service story that your committee is still uh, developing evidence that you didn't know was coming your way even as recently as a week ago. Uh, what is the what is next in your investigation of the Secret Service text messages? Well, we did receive thousands of documents uh, from them this week. Uh, but as you point out, uh, these did not include uh, the text messages uh, at the heart of our interest, uh, those that were sent between Secret Service agents uh, on January 5th and 6th. And the announcement that the Secret Service made uh, when this first came to light, when the Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security first made us aware that these records may have disappeared, uh, I, I think was very misleading uh, in saying that no records relevant to our inquiry were destroyed. Uh, but acknowledging that records were destroyed. Well, if they were destroyed, how do they know they were not pertinent text messages? Uh, it appears, and, you know, we're still uh, looking at this, and it's early in our investigation into the matter, but it appears that the agents were basically left to themselves to decide whether to preserve what they had on their phones or not to preserve it, whether it was relevant or not relevant, uh, and to ask interested parties without any kind of oversight to do that uh, is, I think, at a minimum negligent uh, and maybe more than that. Uh, we do hope to find out whether any of these uh, messages may be retrieved technologically, uh, but we should also be able to figure out uh, just how many messages were sent or received between agents, and then we'll get a, a sense of the scope of what was destroyed. Uh, and I think that will help guide us into asking particular questions of agents about what they were texting about and what was destroyed and why it was destroyed. Uh, according to the Secret Service own description of what it uh, insists on calling a routine uh, technological update, uh, they left it to individual members of the Secret Service to decide what on their phones should be preserved uh, as this update was coming. Uh, that leaves the question of what did James Murray do? He had one of those phones, at least one of those Secret Service phones. Did he personally save anything on his Secret Service phone, or did he actually participate, in effect, in deleting everything from his Secret Service phone? Is that worthy of its own specific subpoena to James Murray for his phone records and for his testimony? Uh, you know, I would uh, certainly hope and expect that the records we've already requested of the Secret Service would pertain to anyone on duty that day, you know, all the way up to the director uh, that may have um, text messages, emails, other communications uh, in a variety of different formats uh, that are responsive to our subpoena. So we should get that information. We'll obviously be looking for any records that are missing, uh, any records uh uh, that would, would tell us that something is being withheld. Uh, we're going to scrutinize this very carefully, particularly after, uh, you know, this gross disparity between what we're hearing from the Secret Service and what we're hearing from the Inspector General. I'm confident, Lawrence, we'll get to the bottom of what happened. I'm less confident we'll ever see those text messages, tragically. I, I, I'm going to assume or guess that on in Thursday night's hearing, we won't be hearing very much about this. Uh, this suggests that your committee will have to have uh, more public hearings uh, in the fall concerning the Secret Service texts and possibly more material. Uh, you know, I think it's all of our sense that uh, this will be uh, you know, the end of the first set of hearings, but we do not believe this will be the end of hearings. New people to continue to come forward, uh, new issues like this involving the Secret Service also continue to uh, make themselves apparent uh, and merit further investigation. How many of those issues will warrant their own hearings? Uh, it's too early for us to say, but none of us feel that this is over by any means. Uh, and, and at the same time, we want to, in the fall, present our recommendations about protecting the country going forward. I think that is worthy of uh, hearings as well. So there is more to come, but I think what you'll see on Thursday will be significant in and of itself.
this is what we at The Last Word call a quorum. Thank you very much uh, for <laughs> joining us together tonight. Uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar, as chair of, of the Rules Committee, this was a fasc- fascinating intersection uh, with both of your roles on the Judiciary Committee, because uh, this is a point that uh, Senator Whitehouse is, is making repeatedly in the Judiciary Committee about how we get the Supreme Court nominees uh, that we get. Uh, And this is after decades of all of us focusing on what money in politics does for candidates. Uh, This focus broadens it considerably. Uh, It does. And Sheldon has been leading the way on this now for years and making the point. And guess what? We ended up where he said we would. You were right. And that was that all of this dark money coming in, funding the Supreme Court Um, justices and the nomination process have gotten us these extremely out of the mainstream conservative justices who are now for the first time in history, we have a Supreme Court, as you point out, that's taking away people's rights. And so one of the solutions among many, and we know you know we're doing immediate work right now on doing everything we can uh, in state after state after state to fight uh, this decision in the Dobbs case to take away women's rights, reproductive rights. But at the same time, we've got to look for the long term. The long term, as Sheldon will tell you, is about making sure that we find out where this money is coming from, who these donors are. People are making, given over $10,000 of this dark money. We don't even know who they are. That's what the Disclose Act is. That's what our hearing is about. And 90% of the people in one poll, 85 in another one, are with us on this, Lawrence. We need this information, and we're going to be able to then better track what's going on in addition to winning the elections in the fall. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, what's the short version of what the Disclose Act would do, and what happens to it if it ends up in front of this United States Supreme Court? Well, it would require the disclosure of political contributions in a race over $10,000, And it includes campaign advertisements for justices as well as campaign advertisements for political candidates. So had it been in place during the uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Barrett proceedings, we would have known who wrote checks as big as $17 million, one check for $17 million to pay for the ad campaigns for a Supreme Court justice. What do you bet? Whoever wrote that $17 million check has business in front of the court, and we should know that. Citizens should know that. And so we're going to fight very hard for this. It's going to be difficult for the court to address this issue because they are the court that dark money built, and their loyalties to dark money have been made clear in the Americans for Prosperity Foundation case. But the premise of Citizens United, of the justices who signed off on Citizens United, was that dark money, anonymous money in politics, is corrupting. They have said that. It's an eight-to-one point of that decision. And so they're going to be hard-pressed to walk back too far from that point. Exactly. And, And in fact, Scalia, this is a quote from Scalia. I know you like when I quote Scalia. Lawrence. Uh, he said in this decision, because as the Citizens United, of course, is has been a very bad case. In another case, he did say, I do not look forward, this is in 2010, Doe v. Reed, to a society which, thanks to the Supreme Court, campaigns anonymously hidden from public scrutiny and protected from the accountability of criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. Why I bring that up is that on 8 to 1, the justices did say in the past, it is legal to put these kinds of rules in place for disclosures and disclaimers. So that's why when you ask what would be the fate of this bill after we pass it in the Senate, after we win this election in the fall, um, I think we will stand well, only because even the conservative justices acknowledge that you could put these rules in place. Now, I can remember the days when uh, Justice Scalia was considered the extreme right edge of the Supreme Court. (laughs) The good old days. It strikes me now, Senator Whitehouse, that he'd be somewhere near Roberts in in this mix. Yeah, the difference is that Justice Scalia was perhaps an extreme conservative, but he was a real conservative. The new justices, the Trump justices, the Federalist Society justices are different. They're not conservatives. They're activists, and they're doing the bidding of very big special interests, the special interests that used 
millions and millions and millions of dollars in dark money to put them on the court. It's capture that's happened here, not conservatism. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, uh, going forward in the Judiciary Committee, uh, is, is there any way uh, short of legislation uh, to continue to press this case uh, the way we've seen Senator Whitehouse press it? Uh, it there's a sort of a Don Quixote quality to it in these confirmation <laughs> hearings. <laughs> where, that's where what he I, keeps... When I look at you, that's who I think of, Sheldon. <laughs> yes. Okay, continue, Lawrence. He, he, he makes you such a panza. He just keeps okay. charging with that dark money sword. Uh, and, and, uh, and he's right. And, and, go ahead. So go ahead. Well, first of all, Judiciary Committee, of course, we've been pushing on the John Lewis bill and other things. Remember, it's not that long ago then we had that Freedom to Vote Act vote. Remember? All the Democrats signed up on that bill, every single one of them. There are a few that wouldn't lift the filibuster. But we are close to moving forward on major election reform. I have not given that up one bit. When you look at all the games that are being played in these states and the laws that are being passed to limit the right to vote. Well, part of this, and by the way, this Disclose Act was part of that, but this Disclose Act can stand on its own. So as chair of the Rules Committee that has jurisdiction over elections, that's where we're going to push this bill forward. And of course, we can get it to the Senate floor for a vote. And uh, Senator Schumer has committed to Senator Whitehouse for that vote. And, and we want in, to see that vote. And in Senator Klobuchar's hearing today, he committed again in his public remarks. So it's a good, good day. And I have to ask you, uh, after reading this report uh, from the House Re Texas House of Representatives that finds fault with the entirety, as they, the phrase they use was the entirety of law enforcement uh, that were involved in this uh, response to this school, uh, what would you do on day one as governor in sitting down with whoever you would put in charge of the state police? I do everything in my power to make sure that we empower the state police to help us guarantee that this does not happen again in, in another school. And first and foremost, in a situation like this, that means that those DPS troopers, those school district officers, those local police officers go into that classroom and put themselves between that gunman and those kids. I think all of us to a person understand that no one more so than those parents right now. Even more importantly, we've got to make sure that we don't have the availability of these kinds of weapons to 18-year-olds who were able to buy two AR-15s, hundreds of rounds of ammunition, and be better armed than many soldiers around the globe are, and to use those military-grade weapons against children, against teachers, against people who are completely innocent. To see this happen in Uvalde, to know that it happened a few years ago in El Paso, Santa Fe High School, Sutherland Springs, Midland, Odessa, so many places across the state of Texas, is to know that this will continue to happen until we change course. The, the common ground is there, and it's obvious to all of us. Universal background checks, a red flag law, safe storage laws for those who have firearms to keep them locked up if you have kids in your household as well. That won't solve every incident of gun violence, but it will go a long way to solving many of those that we've seen happen in Texas and many that will happen in Texas until we take action. We just need a change in the leadership of this state to make that happen. Uh, as you read the report uh, that the House issued, a bipartisan report. You're, you're turning pages in the middle of it where you're reading about this 17-year-old uh, boy uh, eagerly awaiting his 18th birthday so that he can take the money he, that he has hoarded uh, and go buy two, two AR-15s, uh, which he does immediately upon turning 18. Uh, and and as, you, as you hold that, as you read that, you, you're, you're just reading a law that writes itself, uh, that makes that moment illegal on your 18th birthday, that delays uh, that kind of uh, right to buy weapons to at least 21. It seems like the most obvious thing uh, for the governor of Texas to come out and support now. It's not just Democrats. It's not just folks who've been advocating for gun sense legislation for years in some cases. It's Republicans. It's gun owners. It's the Republican mayor of Fort Worth that's just one prominent example who are calling for exactly what you just described. At a minimum, 
let's wait until someone is 21 years old. They're going to have better judgment. Their impulse is going to be under greater control. They're less likely to do exactly what we just saw in, in Uvalde. The fact that the governor of Texas is going in the opposite direction, that after the El Paso shooting that took the lives of 23 people, he signed into law a bill that allows nearly anyone to carry a gun in public without a background check, without any training or vetting whatsoever. After in the previous five years, 38,000 people were pre prevented from doing that by our previous license to carry laws because police said, hey, this guy or this gal is just too dangerous to themselves or to someone else. They can't be armed. Those same members of law enforcement begged the governor not to sign this into law. He did so anyhow, turned his backs on them. So as governor, you asked me this at the outset, I'm going to listen to law enforcement. They know that they're very often outgunned by people like this 18 year old. They know that they're putting the people in their communities that they were sworn to protect and to serve in greater harm. We don't have common sense laws on the books. We can do this. The majority of Texas is with us. We just need political leadership that will reflect that. And that's why we're running this race.